Chris Noring. I work as a cloud developer advocate with Microsoft. Uh, I have a GD title in Angular, so I'm here to talk about Angular. Surprise, right? <laughs> um, do you know of schematics before, or uh, just here because it sounds weird? Sounds weird? Yeah, I know. Uh, it's somewhat of an advanced topic, but hopefully I can tell you what you can use it for. Who uh, here thinks they are using schematics already? How many use the Angular CLI? A uh, few more hands. So all of you are actually using schematics. It's always this trick question to see whether you understand where it's being used. Now, when they uh, invented the uh, Angular Schematics library, they had a few thoughts on um, properties or features that this thing should have. It should be uh, possible to scaffold files that you needed for different things, such as components, services. It should also be possible to update different dependencies. Uh, imagine that you have a package JSON, for example, and you move from one major version to another. You want that to be automatic. How many have run some kind of update tool to go from a major version? Yeah, that's schematics for you, right? They kind of identify what's the diff between different versions. Then they go into a certain file and say, well, you need to change uh, to this higher version and you should be removed and so on. As I said, it's the secret source uh, behind the Angular CLI. And the idea is to make you more productive. Obviously, um, you authoring these schematics should make you more productive. And uh, yeah, it should be easy to use, extend, uh, and so on. Lots of great features, right? So what is schematics? Um, well, look at it this way. Schematics deals with a concept called the tree. And as we all know, file systems are trees. So that's the uh, basic concepts inside of schematics. Um, so what schematics do is to apply changes to a tree. Now you can take this tree that schematics have created from you applying different rules upon this tree and turn that into changes on your file system. But you can also just do it in memory to see what's going to happen if I actually create these rules. It's an important distinction that we understand that schematics doesn't uh, write to your file system until you say so. That's very important to understand. But what you need to do to make schematics happy is that you need to describe what transformations, what changes that you want done. That's what you need to do. So it's declarative in that sense. To start uh, working with schematics, we need to install an executable. And to do that, we need to call this uh, npm install command to get the schematic CLI. Now, the CLI allows you to scaffold up a schematics project. So, yeah, you're in business, pretty much. So once we have this executable, we can use it to scaffold either a blank schematics project, which starts from the beginning, or there are also different helper templates that take you a bit further. It gives you more to start with. So let's have a look at your very, very first schematic, how that could look. So we start by, uh, imagine that we have done the npm install of, of that executable. That means that we got something called schematics uh, installed on our system, and we give it the argument blank. Now blank means that we have a very, from the beginning, like uh, project template. We could be switching that into something else that would be more mature and contain more things. But in this case, we start from scratch. Schematics blank, that's the selection of the template, and then we try to give our project a suitable name. Only you know what that name is. So once we've done that, we, this is what we get. Now we have called it my service, but you can call it your service or hello world or whatever you want to call it. What you have here are two interesting files. One is called index.ts and the other one is called collection.json. Now the index.ts is your entry point uh, file in your schematics. This is where you start out. And the collection.json is more like a configuration or manifest file, so it tells you how things are set up. You can definitely go in and change things in there. We need to understand uh, what's going on. 
uh, at large? What, what's the bigger picture? What kind of basic concepts exist? We have the tree, as I said. So the tree is a representation of our file system, but think of it as an in-memory version for now. What we have are different rules that you need to define, different transformations upon that tree, which could be things like adding a file, removing a file, or even change the file content. All of these rules are getting applied to your tree, and the end result is an altered tree. At this point, you can say to the altered tree, I'm happy, I'm good, I want to commit these changes, I want to make it for real. So compare that to a database, right? Like you would commit changes for real, not just trying it out. And uh, one thing to understand with index.ts is that you have this entry function that returns something of type rule. Now rules are what's being applied to your schematics tree. You also have uh, options, which is an object that represents your command line arguments that you uh, specify when, when you run the schematics executable. As input parameters, you got two different ones. One is obviously the tree, because that's the one we're going to try to alter, and the other one is a schematic context that will bring you more context information around your project. Now we're looking at an actual uh, function. This is what it gives you in, in uh, like a basic offering once you've scaffolded that blank template. So this is what your entry level file looks like. We have a function my service that in itself returns a function that just returns a tree. So this one doesn't do anything, right? It just says, okay, uh, command line arguments, great, return type, rule, great. Inner function, I take a tree and I take some kind of context. It doesn't do much at this point, but we will change that. Having a look at collection JSON, as I said, this is like a configuration and a manifest file. It has two interesting properties. One is description. You can type whatever you want in there. The other one is simply saying, what is the entry point? If you don't want to call that thing um, index uh, file and my service function, you can call that something else. So you can alter that after the fact. Right. Of course, we want to build this, right? We want to build it and we want to test it. To do so, we call npm run build with schematics and we just give it the schematics name. And here you can, if you want, specify some kind of name argument and give that name argument whatever you want. I will show you later how you read from the command line. Looks simple enough, right? So this is what it looks like uh, once you run this. npm run build and it tells us nothing to be done, which is what we expect. We just took that input tree in, we did nothing with that tree. so. The fact that it says nothing to be done is, you know, what we expect. Let's look at another demo, how we can do something more useful. In this case, we're going to try to scaffold a few files. So what we're going to do is so we take our tree and we're going to manipulate it by telling it that you should be creating files. Um, same kind of, of a rule service here, but with the difference is that now we actually talk to the tree and say tree create. This is as simple as saying, here you got a file name, and the second argument is simply the file content. So you're telling it four times to create uh, a new file. If you're wondering who the other people are, they are my co-organizers of NG Vikings. I don't know if you've heard of that one. Um, right, so we expect what? Four files to be created, right? Four different file names, four different contents. And uh, yeah. For convenience sake, we are now adding this execute command here at the bottom where we call npm run build, and then we call our schematics command. So it becomes a bit easier to manage. We run it again. Now this time it doesn't say nothing, but it says I actually did stuff. And I created four different files. We're looking roughly at the file size, 11 bytes. Yeah, that seems to be about correct, right? Just a line of string. Okay then. Did something actually happen? Well, nothing actually did happen. And the main reason nothing happened at this point is that it did everything in memory. It didn't actually affect the file tree. And the reason is that we have a concept in schematics called dry run. Now, dry run is on by default to make sure that you don't shoot yourself in the foot. 
All right. Uh, you can tell dry run to be off, and that's what we're going to do next. So our next command is simply to say dry run false danger here, right? Which means now we are in production. Now we're actually going to affect the file tree. So we run this, and now we can see that we got four files inside of our schematics project. That's not good, right? We've actually started to alter inside of the um, uh, our project for our uh, schematics project. I mean, we're gonna, yeah, we, we're gonna mess this up. Don't worry, I will show you how to actually use schematics. This is not, it's not a good thing to run schematics upon itself. You should be running it on on top of an Angular project. So. I'm just show, showing you what not to do, which is usually what we want as a developers, right? We want to know the hundred ways that doesn't work. <laughs> as for the tree, you can do different things with it. Uh, we have uh, shown how you can do create, but also how you can do delete, uh, rename, and overwrite. Uh, additionally, we can do a lot of other uh, transformations, but this is like the basic operations, the CRUD operations on the tree, if you will. Now. There are some tips and tricks once you start off with schematics that's good to know about. For example, you can be inside of a watch mode, which is a good thing. You alter a bunch, you save, and you just want it to rebuild. If you want that, then you got the npm run build minus w. Or if you want to attach some kind of debugger, you can do so as well. So this is kind of good once you're serious about schematics. Now what? Now we're actually going to apply our schematics in the way that it was intended. We're not going to ruin our schematics project anymore, I promise. So <laughs> at this point, we scaffold an Angular project. Once we've done so, we run npm link in the root of the Angular project and simply point out where the schematics project live. Uh, and yeah, and then we call the ng-generate command. So like a three-step process, give me an Angular project, link that to the schematics project, and then generate. We're used to calling ngg, right, or generate. So we start with our Angular project. We can call that whatever we, we want, right? Schematics demo is what I call it. And then we do the link. Um, once we've linked it up, that means it's going to end up in our uh, node modules, right? So we're going to have this good link. Then we call ng-generate with the name of our schematics project and uh, yeah, some kind of naming argument that comes in here. And that means what? Anyone remember what I did in the schematic? Right, I get four different files inside of an Angular project this time. No messing up the schematics project. So this is uh, the workflow, if you will, when you work with the schematic. So you can just... Uh, create a bunch of rules, define what they're supposed to do, and then you do this npm link, and obviously when you're done done and you want to share this code, then create an npm library, push that up, people can do npm install and everybody's happy, right? And as you can see, this worked pretty well. We get four different files, and the file content is what we expect it to be. And we celebrate a bit with this old man, right? It used to be a gif. I don't know, he got a bit stiff. Right, that wasn't super interesting. I think a lot of scaffolder tools out there can probably do what I just did, but don't worry, I got more exciting demos coming. Um, don't know what that was. You see that bug, right? <laughs> so, uh, we want to use an existing schematic because we trust in the Angular team that they have built some nice schematics for us and we want to build on top of all that hard work. So what we're going to do is to realize that the Angular team have authored a bunch of schematics already. They, call, they are found under at schematic slash Angular. They contain things such as component, module, application, and so on. A lot of nice schematics. If all you want to do is piggyback on top of a um, component schematics and just add some stuff up, uh, upon it, I'm going to show you how you do that. So let's try to add some disclaimer text inside of our files, all the files that we scaffold. So for this purpose, we will actually use the component uh, schematic that the Angular team has authored and just say, thank you very much, I'm going to add my own secret source on top of that, and that's my schematic. So we, uh, again, we create this schematics blank project, uh, and then what? Well, we need to realize on high level what we're about to do. So we're going to add two new helper functions that we're going to use inside of the schematic. 
and then we're going to need something called a chain. Now, the chain allows us to chain multiple rules together. That's what it does. So one set of rules is obviously the one from the Angular team, and another set of rules is the rule that we define. So those two need to merge together and be run in the right order, of course. And then we got this uh, external schematic, which is a helper method that says, I'm going to grab that external schematic, and I'm going to make that part of your schematics project. Uh, let's have a look first at the import. What we are importing here is uh, chain and external schematics. All the other imports were there before when we wrote our very simple one. So those two, we're going to need those. And then what? Well, we need to npm install the schematics Angular, right? And once we've done that, then we can use this external schematic helper function down here and say, well, please uh, go to schematics Angular, load up all the rules inside of there, and let me use those, please. And then I'm saying, actually, let me use this specific one, the component one. Right. So what are we doing on a high level? We are trusting in the com uh, component schematic to work as it should, which means that it's going to produce a TS file, HTML, CSS, if you choose that, test file, and so on, right? We trust in it to work. So that means that once the uh, component schematic have run its course, that means we have a bunch of files in the tree. Now we can iterate each of those files and say, I want to put a header here. I want to put my stamp of approval upon each and every file. So th that's what we're doing. Okay then, so I start by defining this header text and just add some nice copyright or whatever you want to add. I got a string, yay, right? Now what? Well, we try to uh, define the rule. How is it supposed to act? We're saying that we only want to affect TS files. If we want to affect HTML, um, test files and so on, we can, but for this example we have uh, selected to only use the TS files or, or affect those. Then we effectively uh, read up uh, each and every file and we are saying, well, here's my header text and here is the previous file content and just merge the two, right? So I get my header text on top and then the pre-existing file content in the bottom. You with me? Great. Right, so we run this, and uh, we seem to uh, run this with the mad viking statement here, and it gives us a dasherized version of this, where it says mad viking component CSS, HTML, spec, and TS. Four different files, we expect those, but can we actually prove at this point that it works? We need to have a look, right? So we have a look, and then what? <gasps> it works! Lo and behold, we are getting this copyright text on top of all the TS files, so that's awesome. We are effectively piggybacking upon existing rules. So depending on what scenario you have, consider whether you need to build everything from scratch or you can take something existing and just add what you need on top of that. That's a question for you, so you understand your angle of attack, if you will. Now we're going to do something a bit more interesting, because obviously this is very static, right? This is stuff that I type. You are more likely to use some kind of templating system. You want stuff to be as dynamic as possible. So if you can pass command line arguments through the, uh, well, through the command line, you uh, want to do so. And you also want those commands to end up as part of the file name or maybe as part of the file content itself. That's what you want to do. You want dynamic. How do we do this? Well, let's think about our plan of attack here to solve this problem. We need to define a bunch of uh, scaffolded files. We need uh, some templates. And uh, yeah, we need to replace file name with command line arguments. So we kind of need to find a good function for how we do that or uh, rely on a convention. Then we need to replace some kind of template content with command line arguments. So there are two things, different things here. One, one affecting the file name, the other one affecting the file content itself. Okay, per usual, by now, schematics blank, blah, 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 some kind of name of the template, you select what it should be called. And then what? 
Well, here is us relying on some configurations inside of tsconfigjson, because it has this ignore directory uh, slash files. You can change that into whatever, but it's a convention within schematics to place all your template files inside of this, the one called slash files. Anything placed in there will be ignored by the compiler, so that's an ample opportunity for you to place those template files in there. Okay, looking at our template file, it looks a bit alien, but we should know that schematics is pretty smart if we actually play ball, if we obey it, if you will. So by us saying underscore underscore name, what we are saying here is we want to grab the command line argument dash dash name and say, well, do place that one as part of the file name. This is uh, all in the docs, by the way, for our schematics, if you just think I'm inventing stuff. so. Uh, there are <laughs> a bunch of extra clarifications about uh, schematic how this works. There's another thing that goes on here that it's good to know about, which is the dasherize. So dasherize simply turns my component with a capital M, capital C into my dash component. That's what dasherizing means. Uh, so yeah, a bunch of voodoo that takes place here, just for the record. And also we try to affect the content inside the file by saying, well, you know that command line argument name, place that here, please. So we're doing two things here, right? Affecting the file name itself, but also the file content. Welcome. <laughs> I'm getting to the good stuff anyway. Right. <laughs> Looking at this code from the top, we need to realize that uh, schematics comes with a few utility functions. And uh, yeah, I've just taken two. There are literally, I think, 30, 40, 50. There are a lot of utility functions. Those two I've broken out comes from uh, util strings. And uh, I've broken out classify and dasherize. Now, classify just takes simply a file name and makes the first letter uh, a capital letter, like you uh, typically would with a class name. And dasherize, I, I told you what that one did. I made sure that we, I have some kind of dash between you know, my component, for example, or product detail or something like that. Now what? Looking at this line, we see that we read from the files directory. Obviously, if you don't want to read from there, you need to update the tsconfigjson to make sure that the compiler doesn't go nuts. You can, that's fine, I'm just saying. So, uh, but also, if you want to read from somewhere else than files, you need to be changing that here. Uh, we need to understand that the apply function is the one that does all the magic. Now, the apply function is not really that complicated. I bet you've used some kind of templating library before, am I right? You've taken some kind of template, some kind of content, and you just merged the two together. That's literally what apply is doing. And apply needs to know a few things. It needs to know the name of the template. It needs to know what utility function it has access to. Um, some options in the form of command line arguments and, of course, the content of the actual file. Um, sorry, I was repeating myself, but I think you get what I'm saying. Um, right. So this is actually all the code you need to make all the, everything I said happen. What actually takes place depends on how I define the file name and what I say should happen inside of the file itself. But as we have uh, defined before. This is roughly what goes on. Um, I, I just um, started using this classify method now because I actually imported it, if you remember the last slide here. I said well, I had access to classify and dasherize, so why not use classify? So instead of just saying name here, I'm saying please classify my name so it looks like an actual class that I want to use, right? Remember, this one will give us the capital letter of the class. And everything else is as it should. Now what? Well, we build it, we run the schematic, and we give it this argument here. Capital P, capital D, when we give it the argument product detail. And we expect what? We expect dasherization to happen, right? Product dash detail. And of course, dry run false. We are in the crazy mode, so yeah. The end result is simply product dash detail service on the spec file as well as the service file, and we can see that the product detail ha has been capitalized. Yay, victory, right? 
So that's literally how you work with templates. You just need to realize all these nice utility functions that exist, but I have given you two, classify and dasherize, but there are more. You just have to look in, inside the library to see all the nice things that you can do. I've been talking quite fast. Uh, compilers, who love compilers? Who have heard of AST trees? Oh, a few hands, awesome. I never know when I start talking to people when I say compilers and you know they just blank out. Well, yeah, I, I actually find this fun the more I am in the business of doing development. So I, I kind of like the fact that I'm returning back to my roots when it comes to compilers and algorithms and recursions or whatever else. Things that we all found horrible at uni, am I right? Yeah. All right. So what about the compiler? Well, I think it's fair to say that schematics is um, just a bunch of utility functions upon the TypeScript compiler. That's not really fair. I mean, Hans has been spending a lot of time on schematics, so it's a bit more than that. But yeah, I think you get the gist, right? If you have a TypeScript compiler, you're able to compile code. You're able to say, what is this code? How does it look? That's what we're about to do. So we can send in our code into a TypeScript compiler, and what comes back is a tree, right? Just like we've been working with in schematics. Hmm, I think the two are related. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, we uh, read in our file with source code, and the next thing we do is to convert the file into a class here called the source file. Once we have this source file representation, then we can start investigating our tree and see how it actually looks. Here be dragons, am I right? Okay, so let's t take a very simple piece of code, just a simple class, constructor, two different parameters, one of type demo class and the other one is a string. Very simple code. And then what? Well. We want to create this uh, ooh, that was light. Uh, source file representation, so we just tell it, here is a file, I want you to call it demo.ts, I want to provide you with this content that I just showed you, which is the source code, and uh, yeah, give me this node, all right, it says, but for us to be able to see anything, we need this little uh, method here that uh, I bet Manfred created, Manfred Steyer, you know the guy, I hope. Um, to simply iterate through that tree and just print something that makes sense to us humans, right? Now what? So this is what we get. This is just a subset of that tree because it's pretty long even though the source code is quite small. Um, we are getting a node representation and it's giving us the name of the node and the node value. And yeah, I mean if we are really looking at it here, we can actually trace our source code inside of that tree. So we can see where it ended up. This is really useful information if we ever wanted to build our own schematics library. Anyone? No? Yeah, I might do that on my spare time. <laughs> anyway, as you can see, there are quite a few uh, nodes here, and the trick is actually knowing when it comes to altering source code, where should I alter it? Is it before this constructor, after this method, inside of a method, right? You need to decide where that change is supposed to happen. And, uh, well, by reading this tree and see what kind of nodes it is, you can actually traverse these nodes and say, well, after this node, this is where I want my code to be, or I want to remove whatever at another node. Right. So how do we change this tree? Well, we need to start by flattening the nodes, so they're more you know, easier to work with. And then we need to know the next thing that I was hinting at, which is to find the actual position. This is the real challenge. This is where the schematic team spend all their time building utility functions so you don't, don't have to. Because this is hard or time consuming, right? Um, so yeah, there is a, definitely a GitHub repo. They don't say that they're gonna support you if you raise a PR, and I think that's the main reason why if you wanna know how we do it, go into the source repo, but don't tell us about it. <laughs> anyway, uh, once we found the correct position, we are in a great position of actually being able to insert in the right place or update or delete or whatever we're trying to do to our tree. Uh, we need to prepare for a change, and we do that by creating a change object that simply says what's the path of the file, 
what's the position that you want to you know, do something with and what content are you going to give me so I know what to apply. And uh, yeah, then we need to, of course, commit the change. We need to say, well, I promise, I pink is where I actually want to change this bit. So you're saying, I'm going to commit uh, this change and yeah, bask in the glory and admire your fine work where you have altered a source code file, hopefully in the right place. So we start with our uh, flattened list of nodes. That's pretty simple stuff. We uh, call this get source nodes. Now we have a list of nodes, easier to work with. Now what? This is a handy utility function that's easy to write, but it gives you the nodes by type. So you can just <coughs> pass in what type of node if you know f that there are a lot of types that you don't need. So this helps you break it down a bit. So once you have all the nodes of a simple type, you might be in a better position to find that position that you care about. And then what? Well, we, uh, I have authored this uh, create change function, um, insert change, but there are definitely other types of changes, update changes, delete changes, and so on, or deletion. Um, yeah, so define some type of change, uh, the file path, the position that you want to do the change, and with what, right? And yeah, it's as simple as calling it this, but the hard part here is to find this perfect position. Write unit tests. It's going to be a good one. Now what? We want to commit this update, right? So we uh, define this apply changes function. So uh, we want a reference to a recorder. So the first thing we do is to call on the tree, we call begin update on a certain path. Now we have a recorder and hopefully we have a list of changes, which means we do a bunch of insert, a bunch of updates and deletions and so on. After we have applied all of these changes, now it's time to commit. Now it's time to say save, I actually want to do this for real. And uh, the full rule doesn't look like much, but you know, it depends how much your schematic should do, but this is just a simple change. So um, we call this get ts source, so we're using the TypeScript compiler. We uh, get a bunch of nodes in, in the form of a node list, and we get the exact node that we're interested in, and then we uh, define that we want to do a change. So we say, here's a path, here's what I want to insert, and I want to insert it at this specific position. Lastly, I say apply changes, and if you remember the past slide, that means getting a recorder, apply all the changes, and then commit. Sounds almost too simple, right? But as I said, finding the position is the really hard problem, or time-consuming problem. Right, uh, there are quite a few things that you, I think you should read when it comes to schematics. The thing I want to recommend the most is probably Manfred Steyer's free book on schematics. We like free, am I right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's on LeanPub, I believe. Yeah, that's right there. Uh, there is also a good doc documentation on the Angular site, but because a lot of people are not doing schematics actively, it's only going to give you the basic level. So hopefully this slide deck is going to provide you more of a mile-high view and a, some good examples of you know, where to start. Um, Jorge Cano has written a really good starter article on this as well, and of course Hans is no longer on the Angular team, regrettably, but I think you can probably stalk him on Twitter if you want to. <laughs> It's his baby, right? I mean, he wants to answer, I hope. I believe Michael Prentice is the one on the Angular team right now, if you want to reach out with specific schematic questions. And obviously, I could give it a try as well. Um, but yeah, I uh, find schematics very, very fascinating and very useful if I have a scenario where I'm a big enterprise company and I want to do changes that are very specific to me. I think most of us... Uh, otherwise, it's probably just going to use some kind of update functionality that the Angular team writes for us. Have uh, anyone tried ng-deploy, by the way? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I'm You know what it is? Yeah, yeah. Ah, should have had a candy with me. Uh, yeah, so that's a deploy tool that allows you to deploy to Azure. And yeah, that has schematics inside of it. We do a bunch of transformations. So. Uh, I believe there are four major ways to actually do deployment to some kind of cloud operator. I believe Site, Firebase, and I'm not sure about AWS, but I believe there's one more. 
Anywho, any kind of tools that you know try to do things like that, they rely on schematics. So if you're interested, have a look at ng deploy or the one that they use for um, Netlify. Um, I believe that's Santos Yadav who wrote that one. They're there on GitHub if you're interested in learning more. Now, just to summarize uh, everything I've been saying today, it is a workflow tool. The tree is a very important concept, but I, I think you understand that by now. And everything we deal with, with directories and files are, well, you can see that as a tree. It makes your world easier to understand if we understand that everything is a tree. Uh, it's a bunch of rules that you apply on a tree. So far, I've only been showing you one rule in one file, but imagine that you have a more complicated schematic. You'd be writing those rules inside of other files, and you would just import that into the entry point file. That's how you would scale things up. Because I don't think you want one massive file with 10 rules in it. Or maybe you do. I'm not judging. But uh, yeah, definitely it can be used for scaffolding, but also to update your code. You've probably seen your package JSON being updated. But uh, yeah, adding header text or changing code because, well, sometimes you have some complicated scenario and you need to support a bigger company, and that's where you probably want to go in and, yeah, alter code so it works for them. Definitely write unit tests, though, because as I said, the tricky part is finding the correct position. But you do have a bunch of utility functions that's available for you. So before you venture down, I can see in a few eyes, yes, I want to do crazy stuff. There are utility functions for most things that you want to do. It is the secret sauce behind Angular CLI. So if a smartass like me says to you, are you using schematics? You say, yes, am I right? All right. Angular CLI, that's what it's inside of. And uh, I don't think this is you, but thank you anyway. <laughs> Right, we have a few minutes, so I uh, have time for questions. Yes? The, uh, the template file that you showed, what, is there a specific template language? Um, yeah, so you mem remember the underscore underscore name weird stuff, right, with the dash rise. Uh, that's part of the Angular documentation for schematics that this just works. Uh, so it's a way to, well, it's, it's not so much a template language. It's more like if you know what goes on under the hood, write it like this. So in, in the past, I was doing this myself, and then Michael Prentice told me, you know, this actually works, and I should probably add this to the docs. <laughs> that, that's how that happens. <laughs> yes? Uh, what about linting? Like, if you, if you insert uh, some code in a file, it's mm -hmm. like directly after the statement, and it's not, not, not very pretty. You mean like templating language? Or? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's why the slash files is ignored by tsconfig.json. That's literally why it's in there as an ignore oh. directory. Because otherwise, yes, it goes ballistic and says you're doing thousands of wrongs. So, yes. How about if you uh, insert uh, a statement into a, a TS file and um, like it's not uh, formatted uh, nicely? How do you. Um, the easiest part would be to run Prettier uh, over this file or, or TSLint with fix. Mm -hmm. Is there? You, you, you mean that you've defined some kind of insertion or update and then the linter goes crazy afterwards? Yeah, yeah I, I think it's fair that you want to probably add some kind of executable that runs you know, some kind of Prettier fix. Um, yeah, I, I think that sounds like a fair approach. I haven't had that problem yet, but maybe I'm just not using linting. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but good question, good question. Yes, any more? Um, is there any way to run schematics um, in a clean form without the command line? I have the use case as I've already, already written, my, written my own schematics, and they're used to generate code during build time. But to accomplish this, I had to call the Angular CLI programmatically, and this isn't, this is, it's hacky as, fuck, uh, <laughs> uh, say, for most of all since uh, during the last, um, uh, the last uh, update from Angular CLI, there were some strange additions to timers inside the uh, Angular CLI, and you can't call um, multiple schematics inside a script since the timers never, uh, never, uh, never closed. And so I had to hack a little bit of node and something like that. So the, the question is, um, can I use schematics in a clean way inside other JavaScript uh, scripts? 
<laughs> use schematics in a clean way inside of other JavaScript scripts. Yeah, without um, pra pra practically uh, without using the Angular CLI. Mm. Oh, that is a good question. I do not know the answer. I but think you basically uh, just showed you showed that when you use schematics call uh, instead uh. of ng. Just call schematics in the name of your schematics. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah so you're right. So, is it just that the schematic CLI is uh, if I call Angular CLI, something like uh, the ng command, uh -huh. um, that I practically in the background the Angular CLI runs the schematics? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's fair to say. I mean, we had two different ways of doing it, right, yeah. as you were hinting. Uh, I mean, yes, I mean, you got the Angular CLI just pointing out the name of the schematic, and then you got the executable, which is the schematic one. Yeah. And I, I think that's probably the one you want to go to unless you want to run into a heap of trouble. Mm -hmm. That is also what we're doing when we wrote the deploy tool for Azure. I thought the deploy uh, tool sounded kind of interesting since it seemed to be a similar use case uh, uh -huh. to my own. Uh -huh. Um, I'm happy to show you if you're interested yes. what's going on. Um, yeah, so let's see here. Have you heard of the Architect API? Because uh, that's what they released uh, recently to work with schematics, and that's how everyone suddenly can write a bunch of deploy tools. So now that you, when you, uh, so what you do is call ng add, and then it adds the schematics to your npm, and then you call ng deploy. And you know everything just works, but in uh, doing the whole ng add as you are doing, I, I better show you so. Otherwise, it just sounds messy. Let's see. Yep. Oh, we don't have any internet. <laughs> yeah, I need a few more, right? Th that's just the first Chrome instance. <laughs> I think I'm kidding, but um, uh, that's what happens if uh, your uh, daily life is about writing articles and blogs. You've got a gazillion ones open. Uh, right, what was I doing? So this is the uh, GitHub for ng deploy Azure, and this is where we would love to have your PRs uh, for improvements, and definitely if you're interested in hosting it in the cloud, uh, yeah. This is the simplest possible way to do so. Uh, so what you need to do to make things work is to simply scaffold up an Angular project and uh, call this line, ng add. What this one does is to add the schematic itself, but also when it adds itself to the node modules, it triggers uh, an index, an entry point file, which triggers a dialog. And it simply says, well, if you want to run a quick start, I'm going to come up with some suitable names for some artifacts that you need to create in the cloud. Or if you're very opinionated, you know, what resource group, static resource accounts and so on, you can name those yourself. Uh, so, yeah, ng add and then you just do ng deploy because it's been super simple now since the latest version of Angular. Um, so this is a real life case where we are using uh, schematics if you're interested. Uh, we're not doing a bunch of stuff. Usually most people who use schematics do a bunch of things, but, so, but what we do is to trigger the build pretty much so we get a dist folder and then we start uploading it to Azure. Um, but yeah, I think most of the code was probably added on our Azure side to make sure that this is a very simple experience for you. So you should be up in the cloud in two minutes if you have an Azure account. With that said, I uh, also want to mention that Netlify is, uh, have a very similar solution, Site has a very similar solution, and of course, maybe you use the Firebase one as well. So four different options. So if you've got a basement server where you have your Angular app, please move it. That's all I'm saying. Um, right, any more immediate questions? Uh, when using a standard um, schematic and building on top of that, mm -hmm. uh, So, um, positioning is still correct. <laughs> that's a fair question, and I think that's why you should probably have unit tests. So, once you update your schematic version, you run those unit tests to make sure that 
if I have a source code in, it still responds with the same position. So that's how I would secure myself. But my general answer is semantic versioning, because when they do a major update, you can expect things to break. I hope that this won't break, but it can. When they do patch updates, you know, the rightmost number or some kind of feature update, it shouldn't break. Um, saying all that, you as well as I know that the release candidate went and, and did a major change. So, I mean, sometimes bad stuff happens. But yeah, so my general answer is re rely on the semantic versioning and make sure to uh, write unit tests where you just have this snippet of code, send it into your schematic and make sure it spits out the same position. If it doesn't, yeah, painful. But in reality, it should be robust enough because what's there is the underlying TypeScript compiler, right? And uh, yeah, it would surprise me a lot if that thing changed, but you never know, right? Did I say that TypeScript team works on my company? So I could probably just go. <laughs> uh, so yeah, ping me if something bad like that happens and yeah, I'll, I'll teach him a thing or two. <laughs> Pro most probably in, in the form of a PR, but yeah. Um, do you think that in a small team where you need just to add this corporate header in the files, mm -hmm. do you think it's a good idea to use semantics or to use any other task runner like web type, Gallup or whatever? Uh, because we used to do this with Gallup, actually. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And it was really like one JavaScript file where you just have this dot uh -huh. templating system where we read all the files and add this thing in the top. So it worked. So do you think going to semantics is really a good option for this use case or it's for more whenever, whenever you are a corporate and you're already publishing APIs and stuff like that? I, um, to, I see many aspects of your questions. I'm going to try to answer the first one, which I find that you say, couldn't I use Gulp instead when it comes to these kind of templating text? I think whatever tool works for you, I, I think what I was trying to say is that schematics can do this too. But what it's really good at is to go into package JSON or go into source code and understand source code. The thing with the template text, that's such a basic case that most tools out there can already solve it. Uh, so if you are heavily invested in schematics and you use it for everything like ketchup, then, you know, why not? <laughs> so, so, so my answer there is have a pragmatic approach. Don't overuse it, but know when it shines. Um, sorry, did I miss an aspect of your question? No, that's, that's actually... I just wanted to know if it's really making sense for these small use cases or not. Mm. So what I wanted to add based upon your question was the fact that the best case I see is the enterprise case where you probably have a bunch of libraries internally and you don't want to break those for other people. So let's say that you build a library that other people are dependent on. Just like Google, you want to see you know, when you change something in that code, how many projects will that break for? And based on that, you probably want to author a schematic that say, well, if you apply this uh, while upgrading to the latest and greatest version of my library X, you're going to be fine, right? So you want to be go this good developer that says, we have updated this. We know there are breaking changes because it's a major version update. But here's an update schematic that you could use inside of your source code where every single reference, well, for example, let's say you have a method that's called A, right? And suddenly you rename it to B. And if you know that happens, then you can just say, my update schematic could be rename A to B. And then you're doing them a favor. But obviously, test that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Probably A and B is not good names. But I, 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 <laughs> I think you understand where I'm coming from, right? You want to be a good citizen, a good developer that kind of anticipates the problem that people will have when upgrading to your library. That is the same if you work at a company or if you're an OSS developer. Just be nice and anticipatory. Is that the word? Yeah. So that's really where I see schematics happening a lot. Big enterprise companies or OSS um, context. Any more questions? Uh, yes. Maybe the last one uh, to schematics utility function, or the one to the utility function specific. Um, if you call an external schematic, mm -hmm. uh, is it possible that I can ignore if the schematic fails? Since maybe uh, in my schematic, I have the use case that I use the component and module uh -huh. uh, schematic from Angular to generate something and um, then do something with, with these things. Um, um, but it may, may it might, might be that those things have already been generated, mm -hmm. um, so my other changes don't get uh, really made since uh, the previous schematics from Angular fail, uh, so the whole rule chain fails. 
Um, what I'm currently doing is I uh, just check in the tree, are these files already there? Mm -hmm. if, if not, I call the external schematic. If they, um, if they are there, I just skip, uh, skip the external schematic. Um, it's not that uh, pretty. I, I, I have to admit that I've seen two different scenarios here because it's a real concern what happens if you know, files pre-exist and you run the schematic again. Mm -hmm. I have unfortunately seen examples of people authoring schematics where this crashes. I think the um, mentality you need to have as a developer, what if they actually do pre-exist? Can I catch this error and or you know, investigate the tree before this happens? Because you don't want a crashing schematic generally. Uh, I think your main question was, what if an error happens? Can I just catch that error and go about my business to do the rest? I, I think the question comes down as an author that you should probably catch these errors. I mean, ideally, you want a behavior where you apply let's say creating files ABC, and if you run it again and ABC pre-exists, it just ignores, right? You don't want to crash. But I've definitely seen cases where it does crash, where you try to apply the same thing, because it might say they exist. Or maybe you just want to ask a question, are you sure? Because this will remove ABC and create something new instead. So these are scenarios that you need to anticipate as a author of a schematic. What if they run it again? Because people will. Um, and that might be bad. Uh, so I, I think the general stance the Angular team have uh, at least is to have like atomicity to make sure that once you run it again it doesn't crash. Um, I, I just wish the rest of us have the time and the effort to have the same mentality but you know we have a job to do so if that's not our priority concern then we might just create a schematic make it open source and yeah send me a PR right? Uh, I think that's a good rule in general, right? Because they might actually want to. But it's possible. Why, why the schematics run to request some user input? Um, well, I mean, there are CLI libraries, right? So you might need to um, build that on top, right? So underneath it runs schematic. But if you're able to capture that, and I mean, what you essentially need to do is to investigate the tree, right? You need to have a tree instance that represents your file system and just see in the tree, can I find files X, Y, Z, and I know that X, Y, Z is what I'm supposed to look for, then you could trigger this CLI, right? There are a lot of really great node modules for um, doing CLI, so don't try to create your own. There are at least three or four really good ones. But yeah, that, that's just my general answer um, for how I think should, things should behave in an ideal world. But yeah, sometimes we give people tools with very explicit instructions, danger zone, don't do this versus you know, adding the extra code that's needed for a perfect experience. So it comes down to time and effort, I guess, and, and what you think is reasonable. Who are the users of your tool? Uh, Follow-up question to this one. Um, I think the answer was yes, that you can um, ask for user input during the run of a schematic. Um, what actually happens since I uh, basically, if I uh, rely on user input, my schematic is uh, async. Um, that means I could run another schematic during the time that my user inputs, uh, input is still not uh, done by the user. So uh, what does schematic actually do when two schematics run at the same time? It, uh, does the tree get read again by schematic to see if something changed during the schematic runtime? So that does not, uh, uh, what happens in general if I start to uh, um, do async uh, schematics? Uh, Can I say something about that? Yes, please. I think from a general point of view, you should maybe refrain from uh, asking user input inside of running a command like uh, yeah, ng ng something. Uh, maybe if you encounter an error uh, that you just fill out and you say, are you sure you want to do this? Uh, try me again with dash dash force or something. That way, the problem if you're running uh, via an automatic script or something, uh, asking for user input inside of an, uh, an, a CLI uh, command is... Uh, I'm, I'm going to raise this question with the Angular team to see what their official response is, but I like your response. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, this is a gray area, I would say. I mean, it's not 100% clear how one should react and what the best practice is. 
Um, it's even possible that there maybe should be hooks to make questions like this possible. If they aren't there, we risk having five hacky solutions. So it's better if they come with an easy solution where this is possible. Uh, so I, I think for now I need to owe you the answer, but I will lean upon your answer here, I think. Yeah. Right. Um, you want to go home? No? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>